and welcome to the channel. If you are new here, then hi, my name is Brittany. I am a nurse practitioner. If you are a returning subscriber, then welcome back. I am very happy as always to have you here. Much of the content that I create here on my channel, it is educational, but not only for the licensed nurse practitioner, also the nurse practitioner student as well. As you may know, I have completed already multiple different AANP and ANCC reviews. I did one here on YouTube when I first started and then I collaborated with Archer and now I'm kind of taking back to the content and finding new ways to deliver it once again. I've also gone through and I've updated a lot of the material. So this time I'm putting some of it here on YouTube and the rest of it on Patreon. For today's lecture, I'm going to be talking all about the respiratory system for both the AANP and the ANCC exams, but on YouTube here is a shortened version. To get access to the complete video and the complete audio files for the new updated licensing exam for the nurse practitioner, then follow the link in the description below and that will take you to my Patreon. The total review course launches on February 27th and this is where you can pay a monthly access fee. This here of course is free, it's here to help you study. To access though the complete audio files make sure you become a Patreon and join the tier titled ANCC and AANP exam prep course. Again, the complete course doesn't launch until February 27th. I'm just trying to make sure to give you guys lots of sneak peeks of the material to come and just kind of have a build up before it completely launches on February 27th. All right, so without further delay, let's dive into respiratory for the nurse practitioner boards exam. All right, so first up for today's lecture, let's talk about asthma. So asthma is characterized by bronchial hyperresponsiveness, chronic airway inflammation, and the tendency for a person's airway to constrict in response to various triggers. So examples of triggers could be tobacco smoke, mites, molds, furry animals, pollens. Asthma can develop at any age. It's very common disease in childhood, and many children do experience remission of their symptoms around the time of puberty. There is still a potential for it to reoccur later on in life. So symptoms of asthma include dyspnea, cough that is often worse at night, chest tightness and wheezing, and these signify airway narrowing. Physical findings that suggest severe airflow obstruction would be tachypnea, tachycardia, prolonged expiratory phase, poor air movement or what's considered a quiet chest, and then tripod breathing. These symptoms can also be triggered by exercise. So exercise-induced asthma, this typically develops 5 to 15 minutes after a brief period of exertion or about 15 minutes into prolonged exercise and generally resolve with rest about 30 to 60 minutes later. Asthmatic symptoms, these characteristically come and go. Time course, hours to days, they can resolve spontaneously with either removing some kind of trigger or stimulus or they can respond uh, and improve with anti-asthmatic med medications. Patients with asthma, they can remain asymptomatic for very long periods of time and then won't have symptoms again until they have a trigger. There is a very big variable of presentation with these patients. So for diagnosis, spirometry, this is used when diagnosing asthma and it measures a person's forced expiratory volume and their forced vital capacity. So a reduced FEV1, FVC ratio of less than 0.7 indicates airflow obstruction. And so that is definitely a number that you want to tuck back in your brain there. A reduced FEV1, FVC ratio of less than 0.7 indicates airflow obstruction. So spirometry should be performed before and after the use of a bronchodilator and that's to determine the reversibility of airway obstruction. An increase of the FEV1 or FEC ratio of greater than 10% after administration of a bronchodilator is considered significant and it's highly suggestive of diagnosing of asthma, especially if that patient's FEV1, FVC are totally normal 
post bronchodilator. Managing patients with asthma is a continuous process. It involves assessment at each visit, adjusting treatment as needed, reviewing their response to their treatment, assessing for triggers. It's very involved managing these patients. And for a long time, a SABA or a short acting beta agonist, such as albuterol, that inhaler alone was used for rescue therapy. However, the Global Initiative for Asthma, or GINA for short, recommends that this is not sufficient treatment and that there is strong evidence supporting the use of inhaled corticosteroids for both rescue and maintenance therapy. And the idea is that this will protect patients from experiencing severe exacerbations of their asthma symptoms. Gina also states that frequent use of a Saba inhaler, so albuterol, increases the risk for exacerbations. And so here's a quote that's taken directly from their website. All of this information is public, and if you've never visited their website, I highly recommend that you do. I'll put the link here on the screen real quick, but I'll also put the link in the description box below. Like I said, you have free access to this. Anybody can look at it, and there is so much good information. But this is the quote from the article that they have there. Many guidelines recommend that patients with mild asthma should be treated with as-needed Saba reliever alone. This dates back more than 50 years to when asthma was thought of primarily as a disease of bronchoconstriction. However, airway inflammation is found in most patients with asthma, even in those that have intermittent or infrequent symptoms. And although Saba provides quick relief of symptoms, Saba-only treatment is associated with an increased risk of exacerbations and lower lung function. I mean, that's pretty uh, straightforward, and it's kind of wild because you really still don't see it being implemented in practice as much as it should be. But like I said, definitely check out the website. It's so packed full of just great information. But now I'm going to continue on, and we're going to go and cover what we learned from them. And this is how they ask you on your board's exam as well. They use these guidelines for managing asthma. So the GINA guidelines, they recommend that most adults and adolescents with asthma can start treatment at step two. However, essentially, GINA recommends to use a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid with formoterol, it's a combination inhaler, for rapid rescue relief, and not until steps three through five do patients use this same combination inhaler for their daily maintenance treatment as well? And so that's kind of like a really brief synopsis, but we'll break it down here a little bit more and make it hopefully even easier to understand. Really, when you grasp it, it's super easy to, because it's really, it's one inhaler. <laughs> it's just, do you use a PRN or do you use it maintenance? So it makes it actually very easy for us. So let's, it does help, though, to understand, of course, how asthma is divided into steps. So step one, treatment is appropriate for patients with asthma symptoms that occur less than two times a week. So step one is classified as patients that have symptoms less than two times a week. Easy to remember because one is less than two. Step one is symptoms less than twice a week. Step two, treatment is when symptoms of asthma or the need for an inhaler occurs two or more times a week. So it's easy again. Step two is when the patient has two or more times a week they're experiencing the symptoms. Step three is when asthma symptoms occur most days. They are bothersome. They have some activity limitation in this step. And then finally, step four through step five, definitely become a bit convoluted. It's easy to know though because once you think that your patient qualifies at step four and above, so five, six, an asthma specialist, all of the literature says should be managing these patients. If they're at step four or higher, they need a referral to an asthma specialist. All right, so now looking at the steps, this is how we tailor our patient's treatment plan. It's based on the severity of their asthma symptoms and their risk for exacerbations. So 
if you do decide to initiate treatment at step one, because remember, Gina actually says that you can wait until step two. And of course, this is going to take your clinical reasoning and you're going to look at the patient as a whole picture and really assess the severity of their asthma symptoms. So if treatment is initiated at step one, Gina recommends a rescue inhaler that is a combination of a long-acting beta agonist, specifically for motorol, with a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid. An alternative option, although it's a less preferred option, but still, alternatively, they could continue to use their Saba Rescue Inhaler that they already have, but then every time that they use that Saba Inhaler, they also use a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid. So essentially, they have two inhalers with this, but still, they want every time that they are use, they're using an inhaler for rescue treatment for inhaled corticosteroid to be part of that therapy. So they can still continue to do the Saba, but then they have to use inhaled corticosteroid with it, or the preferred option is that combination inhaler of Formoterol with a low-dose inhaled corticosteroid. And the reason that Formoterol is the preferred long-acting beta agonist is because it's effective for acute and maintenance symptoms of asthma. Formoterol is considered a fast-acting, long-acting beta agonist. It has rapid onset and it has up to 12 hours of bronchodilation. The uh, frequently used LABA or long-acting beta agonist with the low-dose inhaled corticosteroid combination inhaler is budesonide with formoterol, and this is sold under that trade name of Symbicort. So now step two has again a couple of treatment options. The two main recommendations are that combination again, PRN inhaler, so the same one for Motorol with that low dose inhaled corticosteroid or a daily low dose of inhaled corticosteroid with a PRN Saba. So again, the preferred option is just that, perf that PRN combination inhaler, but you could also do, if they're already using a Saba PRN, you could potentially do a daily inhaled corticosteroid. Those are the two options. The preferred, of course, again, is that combination therapy. All right, so step three recommends that we implement the SMART strategy. And so SMART is an acronym. It stands for Single Inhaler Maintenance and Reliever Therapy. And to me, this is really cool. Uh, so in this circumstance, you use that same inhaler, that low-dose inhaled corticosteroid with Fermoterol, for example, Budesonide with Fermoterol or Symbacort, Remember that inhaler. <laughs> so you use that same inhaler for daily treatment. So their maintenance now, they are doing an everyday dose and they use it for this, their rescue inhaler. The same inhaler is their rescue inhaler and their maintenance inhaler. Again, that's not initiated though until step three. And remember, step three is when these patients are pretty symptomatic. Step one is less than two. Step two is two or more. Step three, pretty symptomatic. And then that is when we're implementing both daily and as needed use of that combination inhaler. Finally, remember if the patient's asthma is severe enough to be classified as step four or higher, they should be managed by an asthma specialist. These patients can be very difficult to manage and they have various options that they can try. So they can try um, titrating that steroid up to medium dosing. They can add on a long-acting uh, muscarinic agent. Um, they can try a long-acting muscarinic agent with a long-acting beta agonist and steroids. There's lots of different variations, but these are best managed by a specialist. And again, like I said, we are frequently reassessing these patients. We're checking in, adjusting their treatment if needed. Well-controlled asthma is defined as asthmatic symptoms occurring no more than twice a week and nighttime symptoms occurring no more than twice a month. Generally, pretreatment with an inhaler before exercise or before playing sports does not count against well-controlled asthma. Um, however, if it's determined that the patient's asthma is poorly controlled based on the severity of their symptoms and the frequency of their symptoms, then asthma step-up therapy should be initiated. And then once 
their symptoms have been well controlled for three to six months, meaning they're having asthma symptoms less than twice a week and nighttime symptoms no more than twice a month, then you can step down treatment. And so it's really a step up, step down approach.